And we're rolling. Do I look chubby? You look great. You look chubby? Okay. You can't see the double chin or anything? You look great. Okay. All right. Cause you know how it is. I have the sun coming in. And you know what I'm talking about? Don't anyway. <laughs> Welcome to South Omaha Speed. We are on location in North Omaha at the intersection of 30th and Ames. And we got a couple local legend uh, historians here, car club members that are gonna come on with us and talk about this intersection, talk about some orange crate history. Um, after, after it was the orange crate, actually, it got painted up here in North Omaha over the orange paint, so it would be the fourth owner of the car at that time, and we'll get into that. Uh, the, the fourth guy that raced it, like from 60, maybe to 62, 63 ish. So, anyway, thanks a lot for joining, and we'll uh, regroup and get those guys in here and get them introduced. Welcome, South Omaha Speed. We're back on the corner. We got John Sanderhoff here and Ralph Howard, a couple uh, local legends. Uh, we had some conversations about the orange crates and the, and the Omaha Coupe, whatever you want to call it, at, uh, at the house, and at some car meets at uh, Cars and Coffee at Out High V. And we decided, you know what, there was talking about history on this corner, and talking about the car and about all the stuff that happened on here when these guys were kids at this corner. Um, just wanted to kind of just talk with them a little bit and talk about some of the history and the hot rod history of the car clubs and the gas stations that were down here and just some of the things that were going on and we thought we'd capture some of that history and do that today. So gentlemen, thank you for coming on the channel and uh, talking a little bit about Omaha history and, and, the, and the car culture that was happening down here in the late 50s to mid 60s. So I appreciate that. And from that point on, we could just kind of talk about what was going on down here and your guys' thoughts and memories. And maybe talk about some of the service stations that were down here when the cars were hanging out at them. If that sounds good. So anyway, so to start things off, you guys had mentioned the Goldenrod would park right over here by that Explorer by the pole. Is that? Coburg's Mobile. Coburg's Mobile. Yeah, Coburg Brothers Racing, and they owned the mobile station there on the corner. And and the goldenrod always sat out in front every day. When I was about 10 years old, I used to ride my bicycle down here to look at it because it was the coolest thing around. Yeah. And there was a 33 Ford Coupe that sat in front of it that was all black, had a Chevy in it and an old dash. You know, when you're 10 or 11, that's just the neatest stuff that, that you could find. Right. It's just starting to shape you for your yep. future of cars, right? Yep. And you said that was the car that used to pull the goldenrod to the track. They flat towed with that yep. coupe. Yep. And there was another car they used too, didn't they? Was there a. Larry, Larry Fritz, uh, Terry Fritz's dad. Yes, it was a. Uh, what, what year was that? It was like a '55 or '56 Merc. And he, it was a station wagon to begin with, and he uh, he bought it burned out from a fire and turned it into a into a uh, El Camino or Ranchero. I guess he called it a Ranchero because it was Ford product. Okay. And he painted it the same gold as the golden rod, but then he trimmed it in. It was only about half gold. The other, and the lower half was black. Okay, and it was it was a cool car. Wow! And they would run. So did did the Colbert? Because that was a station. They owned the station. Is that they owned the mobile station. Okay. Yes. And did they they build the car there? Do you know or? You know the car was always there when I was a kid. So uh, you know it was it was a legend then to me. I would sure. come down here just to look at it. And what year was that? That would be in the 50s, late 50s, 50s, early 60s. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. I was probably 10 or 11. All right. And you said there was three major gas stations right here on this corner, right? That was yep. uh, the Colbert station was a uh, standard. It was a mobile station. Okay. And then across the street was the. That was a standard, standard. station. And then on the other corner, behind the Burger King, where the that station is now. Moloch's Conoco. Moloch's. Yeah. And some members, some Jacks members worked there. John Pierce John worked Pierce there. worked there. His okay. 59, 348 four-speed El Camino used to sit on that corner all the time with a Jacks plaque in the back window. Okay. Did, did, did you ever awesome. see the purple 40 there by chance? Or I don't it? remember if I saw it there. I remember seeing it at the Omaha Auto Show all the time. Right. Um, it was built to be a show car. And okay. he raced it some too, I believe. Right. That is the motor that's in the Omaha Coupe now. We got John Pierce's. It is. And John and it's his still dad. still got some purple on it, doesn't it? It's still it? purple and yep. got some chrome on it because yep. his dad worked at the, at the chrome shop. Yeah, that car on was On awesome. 27th and Farnham, maybe somewhere in there? Yeah. John and his dad built that in their garage out in Florence. The 40? Yeah. Yeah, the transmission and the, and the rear end were all chrome. Wow. That, that was something back in the 60s. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's an honor to have the engine and have it in the car now, just without that much history. So yep. truly blessed to get a hold of that from the Schumann family. So very cool. And so there was a coffee club or a coffee coffee house coffee house down the street. The guys would hang out there, and all the car clubs would hang out down here too. Yes, the, there which were car a clubs would a lot of clubs that hung out on this corner? The Jacks, the Diablos, the Florence Road Rebels. Uh, you always saw a lot of their cars down around this corner. A lot of them hung out at the coffee house there. Wow. And then this building right across the street was the bank? Is that correct? This uh, Liberty Tax building? It was Commercial Savings and Loan. Okay. They used to let the car clubs meet there in the evenings if you had a meeting place. Missouri Valley Timing Association met there wow. in, the, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, that's pretty crazy. You think about a bank opening their doors to let the car clubs get. I mean, that yeah. wouldn't happen today, you wouldn't think. I mean, that there's a lot of car clubs, but you know, I mean, banks aren't opening up in the evening for local kids to come <laughs> in and hang out, right? So that's just cool in itself to hear that story. So, very cool. And there was a lot of cruising going on around here at night, too? Or not too much? We'd go uh, down to uh, uh, Coniglia's, down to the Royal Boy. Uh, it not, then it became uh, Coniglia's, just the restaurant. Yeah, I, would, but, I was too young then. That would be more in your age, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a Royal Boy, you say? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, Giano Coniglia's, the Royal Boy, 30s and Fort. And that was a that was a hangout there. Everybody hung out there. It's the only drive-in restaurant I've ever seen. They served your drinks with a glass glass, a real glass. When my mom passed away and I cleaned out her cabinets in 2005, she still had about a dozen of them because I, you'd always take them home. Did know? they say Royal Boy on them? No, or? they were just a glass glass. You just glass. knew they were from there because you recognized them. Yeah. No. It was right across from the fort down there, right? The yes. Fort Omaha, yes. where that is? Yep. And so I, I talked to Ken Netwig last night who uh, actually worked there. He was talking about that. There was a drive-in before it was a restaurant, an English restaurant. Yep. Way back in the day, I didn't know that. So that was 35 cents an hour. Wow. My cousin worked there too, and that's what they paid. You worked at you worked for did Mr. Years C. years later, I, I worked there. It, they still had the drive-in, kind of, but they didn't have the car out of anymore. It was more of a separate club. Yeah, then. turned into Mr. C's. Uh, yes. I got yeah. a job there when I was in junior high, and as soon as my dad found out I had it, he made me Right. Because I was like 13 or 14. Sure, but you need that money to get that hot rod stuff going, <laughs> there right? There you go. Yeah, you got to have that, that car money, right? Very cool. So, as far as this area, back in the day, a lot of businesses down here, I mean, not that there's it now, but I mean, there was like Skinner Macaroni, we drove by that, right? Nabisco, which yep, is that's Nabisco. Nabisco. Cookies right there behind and that's you. that's Skinner John. Macaroni right down there. That's, that's yeah. Skinner Macaroni. Yeah. yeah. And that's, it was Nabisco. Yeah. There used to be a big rail spur line that came up here, the New Pacific would just actually... On, just on the other side of, of there and across 30th, uh, I, I, I the think battery that, was, that, was, uh, that was Mopac, that was Missouri Pacific. I think originally it was UP and then it went to Mopac years, yes, but probably early on in the 1800s, yeah. or whatever it was. They Grand Battery. Grand Battery was across the street and yeah. they served them too. And there was a Chevrolet dealership a half block down. Dewey which Chevrolet. Is Dewey Chevrolet. Yeah. Which is now, Huber bought Dewey, so it's... Okay. It's, I can remember in September when the new cars came out back in those years, it was a big deal, the whole family would get in the car and come down here and they tear the paper off of the windows and everybody could see the new car. Unveil it. Yes. Wow. It was awesome stuff. I bet you 63 was the heck of year when they could that new Corvette come out. That mid-year. Oh, yeah. that spaceship, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome stuff seeing those new cars. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, well, uh, thank you for that. I mean, is there anything else we think we're... Molox, maybe. Molox uh, Conoco on the other the other gas station that was up there. The okay. John Pierce worked there. Yes. Yep. And, uh, your dad owned a gas station just down the street, like 30, 30, 39th and Ames. 39th and Ames. Did you work there as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. And from the time I was about 10 on. Right, that's where Gary Shearer worked. Gary worked there, and that's the first time I saw uh, the orange crate. And I was, I walked him, he just had it there, and I looked at, walked up from the back, and I looked at that back window when I, that was about an inch, and I said, Now, how are you ever going to drive that car? Right. And, I can tell you, it's doable. Yeah. We're doing it. You know what I mean? We're loving it. Yeah. Absolutely. I so. love your floor pan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the passenger side definitely needs something because there's a huge hole there. Yeah. And uh, you put your foot right through there. On the, on the driver's side, there's you can't get your foot down in there. But on the passenger side, with the wife and my mom's ridden in the sand, you know what I mean? And just to carry the tools and the sand out to the sand, we needed to put stuff in there and take with us. So everything we needed for the day, we had to take the car with us at New Jersey for Trog. But uh, thank you on that. But uh, yeah, so. 
So that's where the car, you saw the car there too, and he, would he leave the car there to work on the car at the gas station? Or? No, I, no, I was only there a short time. Okay. But, uh, and obviously then he took it, so assuming that was in the garage there behind uh, Fox and Holster. Yeah, that's, used that's where I first down. saw the car. When I went to Monmouth Park grade school, I was in the fifth or sixth grade. I would walk up Ames Avenue to go home and in the afternoon behind Fox and Holster was a little garage. And if that garage door was open, I was there because inside there was the coolest car I'd ever seen in my entire life. Brother. <laughs> Me too, man. You know, when I saw that car in the alley for the first time, I was in high school at the time on my bicycle thinking, man, that is the coolest car I've ever seen too. You know what I mean? So a lot of passion you and I share there, oh. seeing that as a kid and just, you know what I mean? Louvered, chopped. Well, Ralph had talked about it and I told him about Gary having it. And then I, I saw it in the auto show this year and took pictures and, and sent it to Ralph. He was he was in Arizona and I sent him some pictures and uh, uh, I said, I think this is it. Yeah, we you, got you, you can't disguise that car. That, that is the car. Yeah. There's no mistaking it. Right. You know, there was some rumor there. There might have been two of them. When I was trying to track that thing down, there was possibly two of them. Can I heard some stories about that? But it's all been debunked. There was one. It was That was it. You know what I mean? Maybe one wasn't chopped as hard or something like that, but I have not heard about that other car. You know what I mean? It's just I'm talking with Mr. Roseland and all the guys. It's like, that's just that one car. So, But when you're looking for something like that, you're thinking, Jesus, could there be two of them? You know what I mean? Because that would be cool. But, you know, it's come to find out it's just the one. So uh, George's, George's service was on the side. When yes. He, uh, and that was Hottie, Hottie driving that then? That was actually Bob Hartwell. So Bob Hartwell, Hartwell was the okay. original owner, built builder, him and Chuck Servandy. And, and actually Hottie was involved, I think, in the building process of the car next to Dinkers. And then it was Hartwell moved back to California, but left the coupe here and sold to his buddy Howdy with no motor, no tranny. Howdy gets the car, puts an old, or puts a small block Chevy in it, 56. And him and Bob Sugar put that small block Chevy in it and then he gets the big Olds motor back from Hartwell he originally had in it and then then how he did 50 late 56 maybe 57 ish he still he's racing it all over the Midwest flat toning around with his 54 forward and then they take it to Bonneville behind um, Bob Risks 57 Chevy it was a white 57 Chevy they towed it to Bonneville with in 57 with the big Olds and how he had it there they ran like 145 officially and unofficially it ran 165 I think he broke the motor down. too much nitro then he sells it how he sells it to Gohanna it becomes the orange crate right and he was a Rebels member at that time and then it went to Gary Shear who was a Diablos member and that's when you seen it when he had it in the garage up there down the street which we'll go look at here sure I'm really excited about that so it's a shame we can't go back in time to about a year ago when Chuck Cerveny was still alive I know because Chuck so much history Chuck knew more about cars and I mean the only guy that could come close to him is Bob Ledna I think <laughs> yeah. Chuck was shame yeah because yeah. he we were having conversations on the phone and uh, that winter before he passed uh, matter, matter of fact I talked to him two weeks before he passed he was well, you, stories. you talked to yes, Chuck I talked to Chuck he chopped it he helped with Hartwell chop it he welded the chop he told some great stories about the Jacks clubhouse and the cops coming down there and racing 240 Ford Coupes with Oldsmobile motors in them with open headers and the cops came and Wow, just the stories he was telling in the Hanscom Park Pavilion. They got kicked out of their clubhouse next to Dinkers, which was the Shitty Town Tavern back then. Shitty Town, Shitty, yeah. Shitty Town yeah. yeah. And then they got kicked out and they said no more club because all these guys were young and they got these beer crates from the from the bars right around there. You know what I mean? Because for chairs, it looks like they're a bunch of drunks. Which, there might have been some drinking going on, <laughs> is what he said. So anyway, they, they, they pushed him down to Hanscom's Pavilion and that's where they had their car clubs. He said, he got, he said there was like five hardcore racers and 40 club members-ish. And all these guys were paying their dues to wear the jackets and the plates and all that money was going into the racing fund. Sure. He said there'd be 30, 40 cars all parked on the in the park there by the pavilion we were having club meetings with Jack. So yeah, we had some great conversations before he passed. That's awesome. Was, yes. He actually has the original uh, LaSalle tranny that ran in Bonneville in the car, how he's a tranny that was converted to the torque tube and all that for the, yeah. We're losing those guys at a terrible rate. Now. We need to have the history before things bad happen. Absolutely, and I appreciate you guys. Not that you guys are going anywhere soon, but I appreciate you guys telling the stories. And you know, we're all going to get there eventually, right? <laughs> it's the end. It's the way it is. Inevitable, right? So that I appreciate you sharing the story. I mean, I've driven through here many times. Had no idea that there was a big car hub with all the car clubs here. And you know, you you'd mentioned too that Diablo's Car Club shop. Was Their shop was about two blocks from here. Yeah, um, they had a four-car garage. 
this was so long ago, Tom, that they had barn doors for garage doors. Wow. We used to go down there. It's very cool. I know we drove by that site and it's no longer there, but we, we could maybe go by there and shoot the lot. Sure. Just kind of show where it was at. But thank you for that. And just that kind of history there. And I just learned from Bill Hanna, who was the orange crate owner. Right, you know, he built that, and you know, the real way he, he bought the car from Howdy and campaigned the orange crate, painted the Mahal orange. He was a Rebels member. I stopped by his place on Sunday with the car, and that's a whole other story. But he was talking about the Rebels car club was on their garage, was on 19 Cummings, right? Like yeah, behind Creighton University, yeah, down a little alley right there. And I kind of looked up on Google Earth, and you could there's an alley still there, but the buildings are all gone. But there's a couple pads still there. I'll get best. Yeah, guessing one of those is probably the old shop. I was actually in that garage one time when I was about 13. Wow. I belong to the to the Rebels now. There's still some of those older guys in there. Um, there's a couple of guys you may want to talk to is Gary and Gail Chadwell. Okay. Gail built a 32 Ford five window in that garage out of new old stock parts. Awesome. Wow. I remember being in that garage and the fenders were hanging on the wall and they were wrapped in that two inch wide brown paper that said Ford every few inches on it, hanging on the wall. Brand new stuff. Brand new. Wow. Bought a brand new 327, 365 from Dewey Chevrolet and put in it. Gail, Gail would be a great interview for you. The good old days. Yep. Old he would days. remember some of that stuff. Very cool. Well, anything else we're going to talk about in the corner here? Should we head on down to Fox Upholstery, the old, the old structure? It's not a Fox Upholstery anymore. But it's a house now, I think. But we'll go take a look at that and, and see the area where you seen it when you were a kid walking home from school. Yep. And then maybe take a stop over to Diablo's garage. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys.